Good afternoon, World War II TV people out there watching this show. It's our first of two shows today, and we are beaming you live from San Barthelemy, just north of Moortown. And these two shows will be around about Operation Luttich. So um, joining me today, my two historians are Kevin Hemel, from, who's had to get up ridiculously early this morning. Good morning, <laughs> Kevin. How are you doing today? Good morning. I loved how you started with good afternoon. I was like, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, us in the real world, it's afternoon for us, yeah. <laughs> um, and my second historian is from the Netherlands, Frank Gubbles. Uh, good, good afternoon, Frank. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you for having me. No, we're glad to have you. So um, Kevin is going to be giving us all the background about the operation. Kevin is writing a book about pattern. He's already published books on pattern. He writes regularly for magazines. He's a tour guide for Stephen Ambrose tours. He currently works at Arlington. We can chat to him as the show goes on. Frank, the reason he's here, although he's from the, he's Dutch, he has been studying the 30th Division, the American unit we're talking about today, for a lot of years. So he's adding some veterans' testimonies and some of his insight into the divisional history. And of course, we can't forget our camera teams. And it is, it has to be said, a hot one today. Um, it's about 35 degrees centigrade or more down in Moortown. So um, lots of sympathy for, uh, for Mag and, and Duncan who are filming. We also have Colin and Francois there. Francois driving. Colin is producing and directing down there for me. I'm getting so big now. I even have my own on-site on director and producer. And Mag's camera feed there is showing us what it's all about. She's on, we're on the D5 road in the village of San Barthelemy. And I'll bring up a map in a second. I'll let Kevin give some introduction to what we're talking about today. So here is a map of the air we're talking about today and the battle we're talking about, the German counterattack, Operation Lutich, uh, for, uh, around Mortan uh, on August the 7th, 76 years ago. Today it began. So uh, if you follow my mouse here, we're currently in San Barthelemy and this first show will take you to San Barthelemy, Le Neufbe, which is over here, L'Abbe Blanche, and the second show will take you to the actual town of Mortan itself in a few hours time. So. And you can see on the, the map of Normandy where we are. We're, we're right at the bottom end of La Manche. And then beyond that, you get to Brittany. And so this is the furthest south we've been on any World War II show so far. So, Kevin, um, Operation Lutich, what was it all about? How did it, how did it um, come about that the Germans launched this counteroffensive? Well, Paul, um, you know, this is Adolf Hitler's brilliant, I should do air quotes, a brilliant idea to slice the American army into pieces, um, an idea that his field marshals, his generals thought was absurd. Uh, they were the boots on the ground. They had been fighting the allies for about two months now, uh, realizing they were being overwhelmed. And the idea was to pull armored divisions out of the British sector and attack the American sector. As it's beautiful, this is perfect image of, of what I always think of when I think of small towns, France, it's sort of sandstone, uh, old buildings. Can, can we go back to that map for a second? We can. But will you? I, 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 we can and I have done. <laughs> so if you look at the smaller map on the inside, you can see a branch. And at this point in the war, August, on August 1st, uh, General Patton's Third Army is breaking out of Avranche and going south, west, and east all at the same time. So Hitler's idea is if he can get his armies to Avranche driving east, he can snip off Patton and then roll up the American First Army. Now this is, you know, you're talking about uh, wiping out an army basically with a grain of rice. Hitler does not have the troops, the tanks, the anything to pull this off. Uh, and like I, I had mentioned, the commanders on the ground knew this, but they were under orders to go forward. And so seven days after Patton kind of starts running amok uh, behind German forces in France, uh, the German forces launch Operation Lodic and it's going to be a six day, I would actually maybe more of a five day offensive um, where they do make a little bit of progress, but they just get pummeled in the process. They're kind of expecting the American army to just roll over at the sight of German tanks. Uh, they're thinking that there's gonna be a repeat of 1940 and the 30th division, which is right in the crosshairs of this German offensive 
is going to prove them otherwise. The, the American soldier that's fighting in France is very different from the American soldier that was fighting in North Africa early on when the troops were green uh, and then later proved themselves in Sicily. But this sort of idea of the American soldier as being not, not, not invested and uh, much preferring to be home than far away fighting a war, it's really going to get eradicated here uh, where, where the Americans of the 30th ID are really going to stand toe to toe with the Germans in a very desperate situation and basically not blink. And Frank, I'm going to bring you in for a second. The 30th Division have had a pretty bad couple of weeks, haven't they? Um, because they were heavily hit by friendly fire in the uh, in the Operation Cobra. Uh, they've had a tough time getting to San Lo, so they've really been put to Mortain or, or uh, for a, for a break, haven't they? That's, is that correct? That's correct. As they had been in combat for 42 days and they had only three days of rest. But as you mentioned, they had a pretty rough time at Celo, but also before Celo, they already had a pretty hard time. So when they finally arrived at, uh, at Mortain, it was more like being in a rest area. And well, that just lasted for less than a day. And that's when Operation Ludic started. Exactly, so the village we're in, San Barthelemy, is a little crossroads town on the road. I'll bring up the map again to Avranche. So I'll, I'll show you the map again. So San Barthelemy is here. And one of the roads that runs west from there is this road here that eventually takes you, see there the arrow, it says to Avranche. And it runs along a ridge line. And um, this is one of the routes the Germans want to use to, to push towards this port and, and do, as Kevin said, split the American forces. Now, the day before, the 30th Division, and in this case, it's the 17th Regiment arrived. The American 1st Division had been there, but they've now pushed on elsewhere. And the unit, the, the 117th arrived the night before, so August the 6th, so yesterday, 76 years ago. They haven't even got maps of this area. They've only got road maps. It's dark when they arrive. They don't really know the terrain yet. And then the next morning, it all kind of kicks off, essentially. And, and what kicks off, um, I'll let Kevin elaborate on this minute, in a minute, is basically Panzer divisions coming at them from every direction. I'll show you a Google image I made. It Don't expect amazing graphics. I should have spent more time doing this, but frankly, <laughs> I couldn't be bothered, and I can't even find the image I'm looking for now. Hang on, I'll, I'll, be, I'll bring it to you in a second. But there, there's this crossroads town, and, and there's roads coming in from every direction, and um, it ain't fun. So let me just I'll get to the image in a second. And that mag is showing the view to the east, that is towards um, Mortan itself. And I'll now bring up this Google Earth image. So I made this yesterday. So the, the, the rather basic red arrows I've drawn on there are the direction German armor came at this town 76 years ago in the morning out of the fog. So our camera team's mag is down here on this junction and Duncan is gonna be over here in a second. And so these red arrows are showing the direction German armor came at them, which you know, you don't want to see German armor coming at you from a single direction. Coming at you from all directions is, is a little bit crappy. Um, and there's, there's fog and it's terrifying and it really wasn't much fun at all. So we seem to have lost Mag's feed and, and Duncan's. Oh, there's Duncan's feed. Now, Duncan is showing us. Um, he is on. I'll show you the image again. Duncan is... At the beginning of this little track, you can barely see it on the Google Earth image. There's a track that runs between these trees here called the La Sable, goes down to a farm called La Sablonniere. Paul, are you there? I think we lost Paul. Hmm. Uh, can you guys What are we ready? going to do? <laughs> well, let's see, we can always panic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Paul is coming back. Okay. I was magnet. Are we still broadcasting? I'm not hey, sure. Paul, how you doing? I'm here. Are we still broadcasting? Are we still there, everybody? You've got two historians here. Matt, it, it was, I think we've technical issues there. That's okay. Hey, Paul, can I mention while you're, while you guys are reconnecting? Um, yeah. I mean, those are beautiful shots of the town and everything. What's missing is just, you know, pea soup fog preventing anybody from seeing anybody. <laughs> yeah. And that's a real key element in the first days of this battle is this fog that rolls in 
that enables not only the Germans to make a bit of progress, but for single bazooka men to get within range of these, you know, Panther yeah. tanks that normally they'd have to stand off at a further distance. But that fog allows individuals to get close to these behemoths and really make a difference. Yeah, exactly. And and the, the issue is is um, uh, with them coming at you from every direction, as we said earlier, they haven't got the maps. They don't know the location. They do have anti-tank guns with them. I'll come into to Frank in a minute. They have got 57 millimeter anti-tank guns and three inch guns uh, from a tank destroyer unit with them in atta uh, to attached. So they have got some firepower. And here are some images that were actually taken um, a couple of days later, a few days later of 30th Division anti-tank gun teams. These are 57 millimeter guns about in the same kind of area. Um, I'll just show a couple of these. They're not the greatest images, but they kind of work. Um, but you know what they show? You know what they show is the amount of protection for the gunners, which is none. You know, you've got the yeah. one iron plate to, to keep off, you know, maybe a, a potato masher grenade or small arms fire. But if a German tank takes a shot at one of those things, it's gone. Yeah, exactly. So... I think we've got some issues with both. The, I think it might be the connections down. Magali just sent a message. It was too hard for the phone, she said. Oh, OK. Oh, I didn't get that one. OK, so um, there, that may be an issue we have to deal with during the day. But there it is very hot down there. So um, Duncan, we seem to have got now, although Duncan has got his image vertical. Hang on, let's, this is, the, this is the, love, the funds of live TV here, because um, uh, where's Duncan coming? Nope, I think that was part of a mortar round on the ground there. Yeah, there's Mag. We can right. So that's the road. Um, these straight roads that runs along the ridge line there. And um, if we're going to have problems with the camera feeds, we we'll have to try and get the cameras back in the shade a bit. But that is the the crossroads there. That's the where that van is coming from. Is the road towards Mortan. And literally, before the sun came up on the uh, seventy six years ago, Panther tanks start rolling into this this village. And as Kevin just said there, the, 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 uh, the guys, the 117th, are literally firing at panzer flashes, they, the gun flash. They can't even see the tanks. And Mag is pointing out some, um, some bullet things on the wall there, spang, as we call it there. There's not much, because San Bartolome was almost raised, raised from the surface of the earth. So there's not much left. Much of the buildings are, are, are repaired and replaced. But there's a, a little bit of things there. I'm hoping we can get Duncan in in a minute again. It's probably, like I say, the heat is obviously the issue there. So, but this is that road. Maggie's now facing towards um, uh, um, Avranche. That is the road. And you can see there, it is a ridge line. You can see that there is, um, you're on a, the, the road runs parallel to this ridge. And over to the north, I'll bring up the map again. Um, bear with me. So, if you look where we are here at San Barthelemy, over here to the north, or northwest, is the American 9th Division. Uh, and they've been in place for a few days. They've got artillery up there, and artillery are going to be a big part of this story uh, later on. So uh, artillery is a big, big factor in this story. And um, there's the road again that goes off west towards Avranche. So I'm hoping we can have Duncan. No, we, don't, we still don't have Duncan back in. Perhaps, Mag, can you try and go to the lane where Duncan is if your camera's still working at the moment? That's where I'm going, yes. Yeah, sure. And then perhaps do you, do you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yes. Well, the the phones got too hot and they stopped. So okay, well, we have you have to hold an umbrella over them or something for the shade or something. We can work something out. Okay, I'm going where Duncan cool. was supposed to be. This is all cool. It's all these things are sent to try. So Kevin, explain again, again the, the the situation and and Frank. So Panthers coming in. It was chaos there in in the for the one seventeenth in San Bartolome. What was happening? Uh, well, I'll bring Frank in first. Colonel Franklin is their commanding officer. What what was happening in that town before the sun comes up? Well, before um, before they came in, it was the commander of 3rd Battalion, Colonel McDowell, who said at the arrival, if they put us up here with 117, it will turn out to be hell, as they will never put us up in a quiet place. Well, when they went up to uh, St. Bartholomew, one of the men up there was... Uh, Charles O. Hartman, and he was the first lieutenant to send out a patrol. And he said the patrol never returned in time, but arrived back just hours later. And that's when they reported that they had seen a lot of Germans and Germans with a lot of German tanks as well. And 
What he mostly remembered was what Kevin already mentioned. There was so much fog. The yeah. fog was really thick and we couldn't see the tanks. We only heard tanks coming, but we almost only saw the tanks when we hit them. So when that they were almost the sign there is referencing the first American troops who were there. So that would have been the first division. This is five days that they've now gone and now the third have come in. Sorry to interrupt you there, Frank. It was just a no problem, right no problem. And um, well, there was uh, he was talking about a ridge line, and he said when the fog lifted, they saw they saw some sort of valley, and there was one American trooper who was going through the valley all the time, but. When the Germans arrived, he said it, it was just utter chaos. We didn't see anything. And that was a huge problem, of course, for the Americans. Uh, we seem to have got Duncan's feed back in again now, although he's picked it, but Mag's gonna be in the place anyway soon. So Mag is gonna now, very shortly, that lane she's facing now is the lane we're, we're talking about. And down this road or this track coming towards us were a column of Panzer fours, we think. And to the right there, where there's a garden, Mag will be there in a second, were a couple of bazooka teams. And down coming towards us where, where Mag is filming now with it was this column of, of, of Panzer fours. And the bazooka team on the right fired at that first tank and, and luckily they hit it. And what happened is the following, however many it was, eight or nine tanks, had to back up that track. Because if Mag can show the view in a second down the slope to your left, Mag, once you get beyond that tree, you can see there's quite a sharp slope off there and the, the, the Mark IVs couldn't go down that slope because they'd have, they'd have been running into trouble there. But to get to that road that is just parallel to it, they had to back about a mile up to get onto another road. I'll bring up the map again so you understand where we are. I'll bring up the Google Earth image, sorry. So Mag is now where this arrow is, I um, should be indicating here. But as soon as that first Mark IV uh, gets knocked out here by bazookas from here. The column has to back all the way up this lane and then try and attempt to come back in again and join the other unit coming this way, which was the units of the 1st SS. Um, and they're aiming for this road over here that goes to Avranche. Now, for the 117th, they've got, as we said, tanks coming out from every single direction, and it looks like it's all in a, it, uh, they're about to be overrun. What they don't know, and I'll bring Kevin in a second, is actually the German plan is already um, kind of running out of, of, of energy because, um, well, Kevin, I'll bring you in here. The, the, the problem with the Germans is, is if they, the minute they lose a route, they're, 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 their options are being reduced. Right. Um, if I could just add something to what Frank was saying, because I think he did a great job of it. Uh, but I, just, I can't get over how terrifying it must be to be standing there in that fog and hear German tanks coming at you, not being able to see them and what that's got to do to the mind, like if it's 50 tanks in your mind, it's going to be 100. You know, the, the, that unknown element being robbed of that uh, uh, sensory perception to be able to see what's coming at you. Uh, and for those guys to hold their ground, uh, I, I just think, you know, add such another kind of level to the, to the whole battle. But yeah, so the Germans are coming up this road and, um, and you can see there's enough scrub brush trees and high grass that the, the Americans, I think this is the um, 823rd uh, uh, anti-tank or tank destroyer battalion, yeah. uh, that they set up their guns in relatively good cover. You know, of course, you've got fog everywhere um, and they hear this tank coming and the Germans are just kind of firing machine guns into the mist. They have no idea what's in front of them. They can't see anything either. And so because of that German machine gun fire, the anti-tank guys, they're able to knock out the first German tank. And the Germans, to their credit, they're very efficient about tank retrieval. And the tank retrieval uh, tank rolls up and they start attaching it. And the Americans knock out that tank. Now the whole column is, is standing still waiting for this tank to be removed. So the Americans take the entire column under fire. So now the Germans are frozen, they're stopped. They've got to extricate themselves and figure out another angle of attack. All the while the clock is ticking because as the hours are gonna go by, that fog is gonna burn off, revealing the entire German offensive to American and British Air Force, to Allied Air Forces, uh, and uh, the ability to bring in reinforcements. Um, we sh I should mention here, 
uh, very quickly about ultra. You know, the, the allies had broken the German codes. They were reading communications. Uh, and I think there's a feeling that, you know, we saw this coming a mile away where it was really only about two days before the offensive that Omar Bradley gets word that the Germans are massing forces in this area and it looks like there's going to be an offensive. Um, he takes this information to General Patton, whose Third Army, like I had mentioned, is kind of streaking east. Um, and Bra uh, Patton's intelligence officers had kind of gotten wind of it also. And so he had already prepared a plan to use the 35th Infantry Division to break north uh, to reinforce this area. So there's a lot of things going on on a strategic level between army and army group commanders, but it's these guys on the ground in this fog um, that have, you know, been, uh, that are relatively new to combat that are really going to hold their ground in this small town um, and really kind of make a difference. Exactly. So um, we're, we're going to try and move off to our next location because the, the phones have got hot. We knew that was going to be a hot location staying there in the tarmac. They're going to a uh, the next position fairly short, which should, should be a little bit cooler in a hedgerow. So we'll talk about what happened there. So uh, they've got an umbrella over Max camera there that, that will help out, hopefully. Um, we hadn't anticipated the fact that the phones might get hot. That's, a, that's a, um, something we, we haven't encountered before. So, um, hey, these things are sent to try us. But this is this um, um, desperate situation here. And as Kevin has been saying, and Banks has been saying, despite the incredible attempts by the 117th, and they do knock out several vehicles, that the, the, they are they are overrun or they are in a danger of being overrun quite quickly. Maggie's just showing us an extra little detail here in the garden before we head off, which I think new viewers will like there because in the, one of the gardens there in San Bartolome is something left over from the battle. And um, I know I'm not oh, sure wow. if you've been watching. Hey, I before, see that. But there is just sitting in a garden, like it's a normal everyday thing. There is a panther barrel sitting there as a sort of a weird, kind of garden ornament type affair there. Um, I am assuming it's from other ones knocked out in the town there. One can only assume it is. Um, and um, I've shown a few people that on tours, but yeah, there's a bizarre thing there. There's a panther barrel sitting in a garden. But I think, Mag, thank you very much for, for saving the situation now with this with this heat. I'm gonna have you and Duncan and Francois head off to the, the full back position and Kevin and, and Frank and me can carry on talking about what happened in the village. Um, it's all the more reason to keep our um, our timings together today if it's going to be hot. So it gives you a time to cool the photos, uh, to cool the cameras down. Um, Paul, are you telling me that you and Frank don't have German Panzer cannons in your gardens? We don't. Well, I don't. No, I mean, I've, I've got a tiger turret. But no, you know, I just use it as a patio table. But no, I don't really. Um, so, Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> yeah, well, just because we're European, we don't have stuff sitting everywhere. And there's a couple of bullet things there on the uh, on the on the war monument. Um, hey, can and I just add you're doing exceptionally well given the heat. So this is fantastic. So I think, yeah, time well, to head on to the real quick. position now, and we'll explain about that. Can I add um, something really quickly here for American yeah. viewers? This memorial we're looking at is a World War One memorial. Um, and they're common in almost every town in France, and, and you see it in parts of England, too. A lot of Americans, when they come, they assume that these are memorials to World War II, but World War II was so, World War I was so devastating to uh, the, the populace of, of France and England that they memorialized the dead of every town uh, with these small memorials, usually in the center of town, and then after World War II, they would tend to add names of villagers who had died in World War II. But these the, these memorials are really a tribute to World War One and the sacrifice yeah. of World War One. Yeah. That build before they head off, that building Mag was just showing there is the um is the town hall there in 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 San Bartolome, and that's where Colonel Franklin, who was the one uh, seventeenth commander, set his headquarters up. I'll just show his picture there for a second. But very quickly, he has to fall back because there's another regiment of the uh, 30th Division further west. They're, they're in reserve there. So Colonel Franken decided to fall back his survivors to, a, to another position to defend um, because they've got tanks coming at them from two many directions. And so we're going to take you. It's a few minute drive to our full back position. And, um, and I'll put it on Kevin there while, while the guys are driving. So how, how quickly was, um, was San Bartolome overrun, Kevin? 
Uh, I, I would say, well, I don't have the, the time schedule in front of me, but, you know, it, relatively quickly, I mean, uh, the, the Americans tend to, they knock out a whole stack of German tanks, but the Germans do roll in eventually. I mean, it's basically a one day battle yeah. um, last into the afternoon. And Franklin for himself, and, and maybe Frank can talk a bit better about this. Um, he does take on a German tank with a 45 pistol. Uh, and, and Frank, maybe you can speak better to the validity of this story, because when I've read versions of it, I, I think some of people do bring it into question. But supposedly Franklin uh, sees a German standing in the turret of a tank and shoots him and then runs up to the tank and fires into it and kills the rest of the crew. Frank, do you know anything about that story? Well, I heard several stories about that, Kevin. And uh, what they did, I, I cannot say it's true. I'm not 100% mm -hmm. sure about it. Uh, but re what really happened was that Americans ran up to the German tanks and threw grenades into the turret and took the tanks out of action that way. So, yes, it happened. If that was Franklin really happened, I cannot say for 100% sure. Yeah, the fog of combat, you know, and then people really? taking credit yes. for the actions of others. It's a very common thing that happens in, in small unit actions. And that's uh, also what Charles Hartman said. I saw a lot of heroes that very first day as they tried to stop the tanks. And what was really important was that they at least delayed the Germans a lot. Because that also, yeah. that also cost the Germans a lot of ammunition. It not only costed a lot of tanks and, and German soldiers, but it lost fuel as they lost fuel as well, which was really important to them. So, but time was of the essence, and that's by delaying the Germans sometimes only five minutes or so. That could be vital. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I've shown a wartime map now. This is this is where the guys are going. They're driving this way. It, it's a loop here, but it's actually heading west, and they're going to see where the red dotted line bisects the main road here. That's where they're going to. That's the fallback position because Franklin can't, can't hold the, the, the village. There's too many, too many tanks coming in from too many directions. But if you see these roads coming in, they all have to get through San Bartholomew. After that, there's only this one road. So he, there's no roads over here. There's no roads over here. So he pulls back uh, a force of, you know, it's described in the books as cooks, bottle washers, clerks, anybody who can carry a rifle, a pull back this lovely big hedger, which the guys will be at. Well, in fact, they're, all, they're at there already. And they will show you this position. And I'll, I'll show a couple of photos that were taken uh, in this exact location. It's little, this little picnic area now. It's a little lay by. And hopefully the shade there in the hedgerow will, will keep the phones in a slightly better condition. Let's, let's hope <laughs> so anyway. But um, that was a bit of panic there because the meeting ended. The phones died and I was, I was losing it for a second. But I'll show a couple of photos. And I, I'm not 100% certain these photos were taken in this exact location. But I think they were. And these, this is an officer in the 117th here in a foxhole in a position, and he's got a radio there and his M1 and, and the handy talkies there. And there's this rather blurry photo, but I'm pretty certain this chap is one of the defenders standing in this very hedgerow. You can see his, his elbows are resting on a hedgerow that's about sort of four foot off the ground there. And there's big old trees in here to the left. Well, if, I, uh, if you wait for a second, you'll see, um, you'll see where Mag and Duncan are. And you'll, you'll understand why I think it's this location. Sure, you might say every hedgerow hedger looks the same, but um, I think it's here. I think it's in this lane here. This in this track here is where they are. And this track bisects the road, as I said. And you can just imagine if Mac turns to the left now, or perhaps what Duncan's filming as well. Duncan is actually, Duncan's showing the road back, the, the route back the road. So there's, that's the view, the fallback position for the 117th had of back, east towards San Barthelemy. And now um, there are gonna be German armor and half tracks and this, that and the other coming down this road, trying to push on to the plan of getting to Avranche. But of course, Kevin, the fog you talked about earlier, the fog of war, both, both literally and metaphorically, as we get into late morning, the fog burns off. So what happens then? There's another decisive factor that's gonna start playing and that is the air power. Right. Um... And, you know, and, and this is the Allies kind of ace up their sleeve is they control the air uh, above France, above northern France. And so they're going to start calling in um, British typhoons, P-47s, P-51s to start strafing this area. And now, Paul, you and I were kind of joking the other day that, 
you know, that if there was one thing that the Typhoon pilots were really good about was overcalculating how many tanks they knocked out. Um, you know, the, the reality from the air and the reality from the ground were a bit different. Now, of course, they did make a, they did make a great difference, but a lot of times they're strafing the same tanks yeah. uh, that had been strafed earlier. And so they're, they're the, the, the tank knockouts are being overestimated. We, we do but have to I be mean, careful because Matt Bone of the Typhoon Trust is going to be watching this. And Matt is, you know, part of the team restoring the, the Typhoon in Britain. So he will get, oh. he will take offense if we, if we criticize Typhoons too much. Oh, I mean, we're well, not criticizing Forget typhoons. everything they I said. The Typhoon pilots were perfect. We're doing they here. won the war. Uh, the allies of, would have lost of our arm. I'm going to put on Duncan's feet there. Duncan, I, I, I know I wasn't listening to you a second ago, but can you fade, pull back the other side of the road again, Duncan? I want to get across the idea of the ridge line we're on. That view you had a second ago was really great. Right, there we are. See that, folks? We are on one ridge line, and then across beyond where, du where Duncan is facing is another ridge line. We're on that ridge line is where the 9th Division are. That's where the artillery is, the core artillery. And from there, they have got this ridge line absolutely squarely in front of them. Uh, I have to say there are Germans pushing north as well towards them, but there's a lot of uh, mass infantry over there. And the 9th Division have had a, comparatively speaking, easier time in Normandy than some, haven't they, Kevin? I mean, they probably would deny that, but compared to some units, the 9th haven't had a really awful campaign, have they? No, no. They're, and you're saying the ninth, right? Not ninth, the ninth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the ninth is a veteran unit. They fought in North Africa and Sicily. Um, so they've got very well seasoned soldiers and leaders. They know what they're doing. They're not intimidated by the Germans at all, unlike these green units. And, you know, I should mention too, like we're, we're looking at a hedgerow here, but the terrain is so different from what we were looking yeah. at in Normandy. You've got hedgerows, but then wide open fields and, you know, um, you know, different terrain markers where Normandy was such a checkerboard of, of hedgerows. Uh, looking at the so map I'm just here. showing that map again because they're there. So you can see north, where Duncan is facing is over here, where you can see the elements 39th Regiment of the, of the 9th Division over there. The 8th Division are over further north as well. And then further to the west uh, is the remaining uh, uh, regiment of the 30th Division in, in reserve. So even if they get through this roadblock, the Germans have got another position to hit over, over to the west. But at the moment, what happens is this hedgerow that Mag is in and Duncan are at holds firm. They hold completely. And it's, I mean, if you read the accounts, and again, we have to sometimes question the, the, the authenticity of this. Some of the 117 survivors in, in this hedgerow said there were actually fist fights between Germans and American troops in this hedgerow. I don't know whether that you know, happened or not. But if it didn't happen, the point is it does show you things get very, very desperate here. But the line holds. And, and I'm going to have the guys move on again because there's a lot of tight timings in this show and we've got to get to our next location. So I'm glad the cameras are working. I'm glad the phones aren't too hot. You're doing fantastic now. So I'm going to ask you guys to get in the van and head off to Le Neufberg for our next location. Um, we're on course. Everything's looking good. And and just again for this, this, these, the details of these sunken lanes here, and you can see why Franklin wanted to have or chose this to defend that. You've got a lovely big deep hedgerow. You can move your jeeps and, and guns up and, up and down it. You've got a big, maybe eight foot thick earth bank to defend behind. And importantly, you've got a vision up the road towards San Bartolome. Because when the guys drive off, I'm not sure which one is going to be in the front, but whoever's going to be in the front is going to be filming off back towards San Bartolome, back to the east, and then eventually they're going to carry on to the Nerfberg. And we'll tell you in a second what was in this road. And typhoons, Matthew, are part of this. Don't get, uh, don't get, we are, we're, Matthew's, Matt, Matt's commenting. We are going to mention typhoons very shortly, Matt. Don't worry, hold, hold your horses. <laughs> and Matt reminded us this morning that, that, that some of these groups flew phenomenal amounts of missions that day. And, and their presence in the air alone was a huge morale boost to the guys on the ground because they are going to end up being isolated. But if you're seeing typhoons flying over you, firing their rockets, it's going to be a big boost for you. And of course, from the Germans, terrifying. And whether or not the typhoons did the actual heavy hitting, the point is the Germans felt they were. If you were German, you were terrified of typhoons and you, were, you, but you weren't terrified of artillery in the same way. That's true, isn't it, Kevin? Oh, very true. Uh, you know, when you, when you cannot control the skies above you, you know, it, it's a very intimidating uh, and morale-destroying feeling. And, um, 
you know, artillery is, is a very powerful weapon. It kind of comes out of nowhere and it's gone. You can see a plane coming. You can hear it diving on. You can hear it pulling away and it can turn around and come right back on you. And uh, it, it is a very intimidating thing for the guys on the ground. And, you know, and, and just as you were saying, and it's the complete opposite for the allied soldiers, that feeling of confidence. I, I've talked to a number of veterans where they said, you know, they could see the pilot in the plane and they'd wave at them. And it was just such a, a great feeling of confidence knowing you, you know, you're these pilots were a radio call away. They were, you know, basically almost communicating with I'm interrupting them. Interrupting now to talk about this bend in the road. So they're driving back. So they've just left the head zone. They're heading back east now. Now, very shortly, you'll see a bend come in and they're going to turn right around this bend. It's going to come in in a second. That's fantastic camera work, Mag. And remember, we're running on a ridge line and the bend is going to come into place just when those first big trees come in and you'll see the van swing around the run. Thank Francois for driving us today and keeping the, the van nice and cool and, and keeping everything, keeping our cameras. So now it's hitting a bit here, the bend. The bend is coming in now. Right. Folks, by the end of August the 7th, 1944, there were between 25 and 30 knocked out German vehicles between where they just left and that bend in the road. That's how effective the Typhoon Force and those defenders in that hedgerow were, is they've knocked out two dozen vehicles now. And the point is the Germans, I'll bring up the map again in a second, have now pretty much lost the San Barthélemy Avranche Road. So I'll bring up the map again. So, there are two main roads heading west. There's the top one here that goes to San Barthélemy, off to Avranche, and there's the bottom one here that road runs off this way to Avranche. And they've now pretty much lost this one here. And we'll talk about who the German forces are in a minute. There's the elements of the 1st SS, 2nd SS Panzer, 2nd uh, Panzer. Uh, it's five divisions, but they're not full strength divisions. But now already, a few hours into the Operation Lutich on the first day, they pretty much lost one road because of the valiant attempts or the efforts of the 117th here to stop that road. And even if they get beyond that, the 119th are down here to, to provide another blockade. They've lost that option now. And now it becomes more important to come in and see the Germans over here and come in this way through La Blanche and head off this way and try and pick up that south road. And that's where the next part of the story comes in. So. They're driving off to Le, Le Nerfberg now, although as Mag would correct my French, in French it's pronounced Nerfberg, but I'm gonna say Nerfberg because it's gonna be easier for people following. So Frank, we haven't <laughs> had you on for a second. Um, any stories of the 117th in San Barthélemy you wanna share with us or any survivors you met of that? How, you know, you, it was terrifying for those guys seeing Panthers coming out of the fog. Well, I have to admit, uh, Paul, that most of the veterans I met, they fought at Le Nerfberg and not in St. Barthelemy. And the stories I have are mostly from children of the, of the veterans, if they share their story, of course, cool. because not everyone wanted to talk about it. Um, but no, I didn't meet up with many veterans of uh, St. Barthelemy, so I'm gonna wait with another incredible story for Lenevborg, if you don't mind. Yeah, indeed. Well, they just, they just turned right at a roundabout, a traffic circle, if you're American watching this. And that traffic circle was a junction back then. I'm going to show a couple of photos that were taken after battle. And I'm pretty certain, although not 100% certain, but I'm pretty certain that these two photos of knocked out German vehicles were taken around the roundabout or area they have just driven around. So there's one there of a couple of Panthers. Uh, and there's a second photo I'll get to in a second. And they were taken in the area that the guys have just driven. And this was all taken during the surveys that were done a few days later. There's another Paul, if I, could, if I could add something. Of course um, you can. Yeah, please, that's what you're here for. <laughs> I was reading a story about just kind of showing the ingenuity of the Americans. Uh, one of the bazooka guys, uh, St. Bartholomew, um, his, his bazooka broke or, or wouldn't operate. <clears throat> so in the fog, he runs out and finds another one and knocks out two German tanks. And I think that really kind of speaks to the the training and the esprit de corps of the Americans that, you know, instead of running, he's got a broken bazooka. And what does the soldier do? He goes and finds another one uh, not and knocks out not just one German tank, but a second one. And yeah. so it's that kind of stout defense that the Germans are really not prepared for. I think Adolf Hitler thought it was going to be a fast roll through 
you know, to a brunch, you know, uh, you know, he's like, you know, it's like going to Wisconsin or something like that. And all of his German generals are like, no, you have no idea what the allies are capable of. And, you know, that this kind of fighting that we're seeing in these small areas is indicative of that. So the guys that is parking in a Nürburg, a little, little crossroads area now, and they're going to hop out and they're going to show a couple of uh, then and now photos um, taken here after battle. And we'll talk about the fact that while all this action is happening in San Bartolome, the 30th Division are busy setting up roadblocks around this area here. And the road, although it runs kind of north-south through the Nürburg, it, it picks up both those roads to the north and there's Duncan smiling there being a, being a, being a gurning idiot that he is. Well, we love him. Um, <laughs> Um, well, we think we love him. Do we love him? We love Duncan, don't we? Yeah, and yeah, we um, love Duncan. Yeah, we love him. We love that. We all He's love him. We and good. we love Mag and Colin and Francois. And yeah. they're going to try and match up these photos. I'll just I'll show you the map first. There's a map here that's from the 30 Division history, and it says the roadblock at Abbe Blanche. Well, actually, it's talking about the Abbey is part of the Nerfburg. So, um, we're not actually going to the Abbey, but there's a bridge that runs through over the railway line. And the guys have just parked here where I'm pointing with the, um, the mouse there. And ar around the roads, they've got anti-tank guns, they've mined the roads, they've got troops defending, they've got 50 cows, they've got the, the tank destroyer anti-tank guns. It's not a, it's, they've got some firepower, though there's not many of them. And there's certainly not many of them when you've got columns of Panthers and Mark IVs and half tracks coming at you. But this is where they are now in this, on this crossroads here. And I'll show you so there's a building there there's colin having a drink of water and i'll now show you the photos that were taken at that area so here is that's the same building that's where the guys are parked and their van is parked about where the deuce and a half is here with no tarpaulin on the back no canvas this little building in front is now gone there's now a little monument there and the road off uh on the right there runs uh those two roads run into mortan and they've just come down facing that shot there is where they've driven in. And this, you can tell there's no battle going on here. This is sometime later in August when this road is being used um, for, for transport and for as a logistics. But oh, that's fat. I didn't show that. I'll show you the one again. But that is nevertheless where we are. Turn it around the other way. Can you show tell can, the you, can you show tell the again the now, Duncan? So there's the cafe there parked in front. There's a guy, the guy crossing the road there. And where's, where's, where's Duncan's? So Duncan is now, there's that same, yeah, there's the cafe. So Duncan's facing, turn around now and face north, Duncan. For us, please. And, and you're doing exceptionally well, given how hot it is there. Uh, there we go. So that's the view north that I just showed you. I'll, I'll bring up the image again. Not exactly the, 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 uh, the right angle, but close enough. I'll just find a photo. So Duncan is standing about where that tree is there. So these buildings and the photo there are the ones that are on Duncan's right. And these buildings on the left are on Duncan's left. And Duncan is facing up. But Duncan's not far away from where this chap is crossing the road here. Hello. Hang on. Okay. You've got bad bandwidth there. Tell him to get in the shade. Get in the shade. Uh, we'll, get, we'll put Max feed on again. <laughs> so, um, no, don't worry. We've got we've we've got we've established that. I think we'll have you drive off the railway station a second because you know time is again. We're already forty five minutes in. But this is the village of Lanerfburg where they start setting up these roadblocks. But. We're just showing you this is a bonus, really, because the next location is the really sexy one. Um, that's where the really great photos are taken uh, of the battle. So that was just a bonus as we came through the town now to show you those ones there. But guys, we'll have you drive on to the railway station now and we'll talk about the next part of the battle. Brilliant job, guys. We love what you're doing. So Kevin and, and, and Frank, the, these, these, um, these roadblocks they're setting up, um, this is fairly improvised, isn't it? They, they don't really know what's... When they're set up, they don't quite know what's coming at them and from where, do they? No. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of this is on sound. And, um, you know, the commanders are radioing back for reinforcements. So they are racing anti-tank guns and more guns to the front. These guys have to rapidly set up. They've got to figure out uh, what the, their angles of fire are going to be, what's the best place to do this within seconds. 
You know, they they know that time is against them, that they can hear these tanks coming at them. Um, it's really a reaction instead of a strategy. Frank? But, but sometimes that's the best way to do it, isn't it? I mean, it's it, when there's tanks coming at you, you don't, you don't need to worry about sighting your guns. Just fire the tanks. They, they, it's kind of low end, but it works, doesn't it? Just, you know, uh, yeah. choose the tanks. Yeah. They, they don't need to be much cleverer than that in some way. So they're going off this other location. This is one of the ones when every historian, tour guide, author, Normandy buff goes to this location the first time, they have that wow moment when they match up the photos you see in the books. And I had that moment when I first time 20 years ago, I had the privilege of taking James Holland on his World War II documentary show last April there. He had his wow moment there. I can't imagine how many tour guides and historians have had their first wow moment here. But I'll show you on the map where they are. There's a road running. So bring up the map again. So they've now come down to here is a railway station marked here. So they've, they've driven down uh, this road here and they're parked by this railway station. This is one of the other axes of advance the Germans are using. First SS, this is elements of first SS are coming down here to get into Mortan, to, to get to Nürburgring, to get to Mortan, to get to the road to Avranches. And what they do is they run in to these hastily set up gun teams that Kevin and we'll bring in Frank and Minna have been have been talking about. So, well, that that shot there, whoever that they magically they hold that shot there. Now look at those for those watching. Look at that tree with the very bendy trunk there in the middle there. Okay, and I don't know where Duncan is. Is Duncan showing the re Duncan's got the other or the reverse order? So there's Duncan showing back the other way with the rail. Hang on, where's Duncan's feed coming in? There's Duncan. There's the railway station. So have you got those two views in your in your minds now, viewers? So there's that view, and we'll put back on Mag's view again. Well, here are the photos that were taken here and you'll go, my God, that's incredible. You'll, you'll be as impressed as we were the first time we saw these. So <laughs> where, let's get into my photo. There we go. So there is that bendy tree. Can you see it there? Bring it. There's the tree with the, the, the bendy trunk there. And on the oh, right oh. there is a knocked out first SS half track. And there's another uh, Schwimmwagen there. There's a dead German there. And they run into gunfire from both along the road. And also, I'll get into the film, there's a railway embankment running, or an embankment on the railway to their right. They come under fire from higher ground within the trees. That's an amazing photo, that one. Now I'll go back. There's Duncan's view. See, there's the railway station. You see that there? And there's a G oh. there, another G. There's a Schwimmwagen there. There's another German vehicle. And there's a building on the right there. And I'll stop sharing the image in a second and go back to the live image. So going back on Duncan again, there we are. Uh, it takes a couple of seconds for the image to come in. There is the same view there and there. I'll put it on Mag's image again. Well, all that stuff happened right in that road there. And Mag is safely keeping under the shade of the trees there. Uh, is, it, is it a little bit shadier there, guys? Are you a little bit less hot? Paul, how far away are they from each other right now? Uh, 20 meters, not very far. Okay, and how so do we know that's this? How do we know that's the same bendy tree? I mean, aren't those very common? It, all over it France? just is. We, you can you, you can stand. Honestly, <laughs> we were doing it last week. You can match up tree by tree, branches by branches. There's even the gaps in the tree line where one of the half tracks knocked out a tree, and there's still the gap where the tree that should be there is missing. So honestly, it is absolutely perfect there. And the Abbey right. Blanche is over ahead of us, beyond those line of poplar trees that Mag is filming there. And Duncan, I think, is going to show us some of the, Duncan's king of Spang, he's going to show us some of the bullet holes on the station in a minute. And this station was used uh, for passengers to Mont Saint-Michel in the sort of 20s and 30s, and then it was used for freight up until the 80s or 90s, I believe. Um, and uh, Mag, Mag's, Mrs. Mag, Mag's looking at her favourite tree. She did, took a photo of this last week, because look how the camouflage, or the, the pattern of that tree is just like the German camouflage, the oak leaf kind of patterns you get on the camouflage smocks, how, how clever the Germans were at, at, at camouflage. So um, this is the Nürburgring station just north of Mortan on the little on the road between Nürburgring and Gere is the town is where they are. And there's Francois's van back there. I've got some more photos of this location. I'll just whack up for you quickly. But so Paul, if I can interrupt you. If I can interrupt Paul. Sorry? If I can interrupt for a second, um, because I just want to second what you are telling for those who have never been to Le Neuf Borg 
and see the original pictures at that same spot, well, I can just say you need to be there because that's indeed that wow factor. That if you're standing up there, that's what that's what I thought the first time I was there. It was like, wow, that's just where it's all about, if I may say so, because you're really standing in the footsteps and you can see what kind of a hard battle it was. It was not just coming in, you have been fired at and you pull back. No, it is a real hard battle. And the the battle for Mortain has been neglected, uh, neglected for a very long time. And I'm happy that more um, interest is in it right now. So I love the, the pictures you're showing and indeed camera people are doing a fantastic job. They certainly are giving it sound. I'll, I'll bring up that because Mag's in exactly the right location to get that photo again. So I'll just find the right one again. Where is it gone? Guys, I'm embarrassed to admit I've never been there. I, I'm usually racing to get to the, so, the hill, you know, uh, east of Mortain and I'm like, I gotta, I'm taking the tour group there next time I go, man. This yeah, so is incredible. Again, so you can park up. So that building on the right there, that's exactly where Mag is. So and that and this tree, there's this tree here. You can match up all the branches, and there's the station there. I'll show you. So there's Mag's view again. There's the building, there's the station, there's the same branches and the same tree there. Everything is just bang on. You know, it, it's it is so good. Um, I think Duncan's got some bullet holes, maybe now. Or is it your phone too hot? We'll see. And then we're going to show you to our last location for this one. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, bullet holes on the left-hand side of the building. How are you doing, Duncan? All good, buddy. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Kevin, uh, well, Frank, Kevin, fill us in about these actions. So these are these are three-inch guns, 50 cows, lion mines across roads, and they're basically doing whatever they can to stop vehicles coming this way. Uh, Frank, have you got any kind of personal stories? Because you said you some of your veterans you spoke to were in Lenerfburg, or are they more up on the uh, on the main part of town? They were, were morely, uh, mostly on the on the western side of Lenerfburg, but of course the Germans were coming in from uh, from the north, from uh, from Sordeval, and that's where they indeed were trying to get through Lenerfburg into Mortain. But luckily they were stopped up there. But the main story I have is on the western side of Lenovo. Yeah, which, which we're getting to next. For some reason, Duncan's bandwidth is low there. I can't get you into the, I can't get your image on screen, Duncan. I don't know why. I'll try, I'll get Maggie's again. No, I can't. I think Maggie's giving you the finger. Yeah, possibly, quite <laughs> possibly. I can't, for some reason, Duncan's feed is not coming in. I don't know why I can see it on my screen, but I can't see it. I can't put it on there. But um, if you can just show us a couple of the bullet holes, because for some reason we're not getting Duncan's image at the moment. Maybe at the next stop we'll have Colin's phone try and try, try, bring in maybe if Duncan's got a problem. I don't know why we're not. But there's loads of bullet holes all over that state. Hang on, maybe we've got Duncan again now. You can see the dinks in the red brick. Yeah. Now, Duncan, that corner there too. With his load for some reason. I don't know why we're not we're not getting your images well, Duncan. So we'll go back. Well, and, I go have back that to problem all over northern France. Oh, there they are. There's there's all the bullet wangs on the station there. So if you go there, you can clearly say it's the it's the correct the correct locations we guys um, showed. That's quite a testament. Yeah. And it's quite close to the route, Kevin, so it doesn't take a long detour to get there. Okay. Yeah, it's just five minutes from the town. So, well, that's fantastic, guys. I think we'll head off to our final section into, into, into West Northburg again. And you can see the original station sign there. And maybe Duncan will lock you, bring you out and bring you in again. I don't know, because you're about, I've, I've just put you in the waiting room, Duncan. Um, this is good stuff. So, um, Going back to the uh, the story here of, of Lenerfburg uh, and these guns, I said there's tank destroyer units, there's anti-tank guns there. Um, it, the action starts happening at five o'clock in the morning and these half tracks come in down this road and and they're also trying to bring, there, is it, there's typhoons flying overhead. There are unfortunately some, um, some friendly fire incidents because all these things are happening very quickly. There have been some comments on YouTube guys about the fact that Ultra um, has had picked up the Germans are going to counterattack, and of course that is a that is a factor. The reason we're not going to be talking about it too much 
is that these guys on the ground have been, would have been almost completely unaware of what's happening at a higher level. We're focusing on what these guys in the third division knew was happening around then. Sure, as we were talking, Kevin and I were talking yesterday, Bradley and Patton are aware of information coming through, but the guy is in the 30 division. If you were a private in the 117th, you had no idea that Ultra had picked up this counterattack. You were just reacting to what's happening in front of you. And you know the things on World War II TV now. We're trying to focus on the guys on the ground more so than we are the higher level, what the generals are discussing, because that's that's we leave for other people to discuss that. So um, we'll have you guys go off into town now, and um, we'll talk about our, fi our final story of this first part of the show. We're going to try and keep these two shows to about an hour and 15 minutes each or so, especially because it's hot today, and give the guys time to have their cameras, batteries charged and cool themselves down. And um, But that's a great location there, the station in Lenerthburg. I'll show you on the map again where we are, just so there's people watching who want to plan their trips. So this is the main road that runs north-south uh, north from uh, so via Sordeval through Lenerthburg to Mortan. But in the village of Lenerthburg, you take the turning off to the, uh, the east here, and you come down the road and you park by the station here. That arrow there is where those German vehicles were knocked out and they were first SS half track. So that's the location for those watching. When you come in or in, in your next trip to Normandy, head down to Mortan. Don't just do the hill, do Lenerthburg. And if you love that story, our next story, the personal story in Lenerthburg is gonna kind of really rock your world. And this is all gonna be credit to Frank because um, this story he got from a veteran is, is, is all new stuff first for um first to be to be put into a documentary essentially so um the guys are heading off to the other side of the village the western side of the village and um we'll see if duncan's footage is coming in better now paul if i could add real quickly i was in my research um but they they you know we're trying to send reinforcements to the area and they send a company about a hundred guys uh, and I think they're from the 119th and they make it to Nerfberg and the, and uh, you know, the commander sees him. He says, Hey, my job, we're, we're, we're heading over to Mortain. We, we need to reinforce them. And the guy says, you're not going any further than this. And he goes, well, we got to. And so they advance a little bit and then they see the amount of tanks surrounding Mortain, uh, all the German tanks, both knocked out and operational. And he goes, yeah, this is a terrible idea. And, and goes back to Nerfberg to be part of the defense there. So Mag's image now, Mag is driving down a road parallel to the main road. This is called Rue de l'Eglise, the, the road, church road. And this, I literally went there my first time last week on my recce. Frank's been there a couple of times before researching this story. And this is the, the one we're bringing to you as kind of an exclusive. And Kevin doesn't know this story either. Uh, so this is all gonna be Frank's story here. So tell us about how uh, John O'Hare, uh, uh, Frank, how did you get to know um, John? Uh, well, to put that in a nutshell, uh, I've always been interested in the 30s as they liberated my hometown. And John made a little painting and I bought it and he wrote his name on it. And that's how I got in touch with him. But uh, John, and that was 15, 16 years ago. And I've been in touch with him since, as John is still alive. Luckily, he's still with us. Um, but John sent me his complete story about the Battle of Leneuf Bourg. And that, that picture was taken last September when John returned to the Netherlands for the 75th. And that's an actual painting he made. Um, well, John sent me a story which is about seven or eight pages. And that's only the Battle for Leneuf Bourg. And John said, we came in from the West, and as he was part of Easy Company 2nd Battalion, 117th, and he was writing about a little bridge with a railroad on top of it, and that will be right at the at the spot where they stop right now. Yeah, I think that... You have, have to go back and then... Off there, and then Mag's going to drive up in, I think, is that what's happening, guy, you driving on? Yeah. Because they just passed by the... Uh, Pass by the bridge. Yeah. Um, but John, on the other side of the bridge, that's where John had his foxhole. And John said, from my point of view, I could see the church tower in Lenevborg, but I could also see the Abbe Blanche. And they were, they realized that 2nd Battalion 120s who were on top of Hill 314, they should, they would be uh, surrounded. And when they, at 
2,200 hours on August the 6th. That's, John said, that's when the battle started. And from midnight on, we had a constant artillery fire coming towards us. And when they realized that the 120th, uh, 2nd Battalion, 120th would be cut off, that's when the order came in that a task force would go up to the hill and relieve the guys or uh, uh, join the guys on top of Hill 314. And that would have been, that attack would have been made on August the 7th at 0800 hours. But for some reason, one officer, maybe he was overworked or whatever, he took a decision and delayed that attack until 1300 hours that day. And that's when the second SS Panzer Division already cut the man off on Hill 314. And I don't know where Magli is right now. That I'll I think just, she's at the Sunken Road. I'll interrupt you for a second, Frank. So the guy, sure. there's a church on the mon on the map there. That's the, the yes. wartime map there. And the, there's a bridge there that Frank just mentioned. So we're talking about this area of the Northburg. It's actually, um, so the west of the road there. So we were, the rail bridge we were on a minute ago is over here. And now we're, sorry, over north here. We're now in this area here. So I'll stop that map. So, so Mag is on the main road in, in the Northburg. There's the well, main road that heads sort of north south and Duncan is in a little lane a well, little road with a wall um I could bring Duncan's image in now Duncan's bandwidth is low okay before before I'm coming to that uh keep, keep Paul, on, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Mag there for the moment okay because this is actually after the attack they made because they came underneath the bridge and took a left turn alongside the cemetery which is on the other side but it's not a problem um, John noticed that most of the grave marks had been tossed over the wall because of the artillery fire, which happened during the entire night. And that's when they reached the Rue de l'Église, the church road, took a right turn. And that's the second road leading into Mortain from Le Neuf Bourg. After about one kilometer, the, the road goes down, takes a left turn, and on the hill on the other side, that's where the Germans were. And they started shooting at Easy Company with everything they had. So Easy Company had to pull back a strategic withdrawal as uh, John mentioned it. But most of the men went into the houses on the Western side of the road. And they left the houses through the back door and then run through the gardens and had to climb over stone walls until they got into a sunken road, which is to the left. And well, when, when they, got to that, uh, to that road, they realized that they didn't have a rear guard. So six men were put up, and there were more than six men in, the, in that sunken road, which is to the left. It's a little bit backwards. So if Magali can walk back. Can you turn around, Mag? Oh, let's go, with, let's go up to Duncan, because Duncan is in, in that. The problem is I can't. I can't. Oh, okay. As soon because, as I try to share his screen, it just it doesn't it doesn't go unless I put it. Okay, on. well, you can see the sign that you're uh, exiting Le Neuf Bourg, and right behind it, you can see that dirt road going to the right. That's that yeah. sunken road John is talking about. And yeah, it seems Mag has come down to join Duncan because yes. we're not getting any of Duncan's images. I don't know why. So sorry about well, this. Frank. This will do. This will do, Paul. Bit, no uh, problem. So this is that sunken road and John was a little bit further up that sunken road. And when it, six men got to duty to put up a rear guard and John was one of them. And as soon as the CEO left up there, that's when the other five guys went back to the sunken road and took shelter. And John said, I moved on. And after a while, I decided to go back to the sunken road. And what I saw was that about three mortar shells had hit that sunken road and were eight guys up there, eight casualties. And John told me personally that he said, if I made the decision to go back to that sunken road, I would have been killed up there. And that's John in the 1980s in that same sunken road. So that's a picture he sent me. And well, actually, if Magali can turn around, must be somewhere up there. The last time I was there, there was not so much overgrowth, but that must be the, the brown stone somewhere yeah, up there. Yeah. And there's some, there's some damage up there where they are. 
there's some damn there's some bits of the wall that are missing possibly from this mortar strike that's possible that's something he didn't write about so i don't and never talked about that so as john didn't see it personally i i guess he left that out but yeah i mean that's... maybe because we walked further up the road than he there's some damage there um that we assume could well be from the um from the uh the shelling I, i'm yeah, there we are now. There's some damage. I mean, it could just be from falling down from age, Possible. but but there, just up there, it's where that lane actually bisects and connects up the main road again. So we're thinking that could be um, where that happened. Well, what happened after that first attack was that an M10 tank destroyer showed up. And according to John, most likely, he took a, a wrong turn somewhere, but he had a lot of K rations with him. And that's for the man of easy company, 117th. That was the fact that they didn't become really hungry as they couldn't get backwards as they were surrounded as well. They made that attack on August the 7th, but that was not the only attack they made. They made that same attack down to down the uh, Rue de l'Eglise every day, every morning, several afternoons until the end of the battle. They always tried to get to Hill 314. Yeah. And what and well, I like when you sent me this story, um, Frank, is that, that it, the whole thing that made it unique was that um, John and his the, buddies were attacking because when you read yes. about the 30th Division, you read about this very defensive nature. It's they're holding off against Germans, but his unit are pushing down um, into trying to get into town to try and relieve uh, their buddies. And there's that great line. If you, wait, you I'll let you do the line. Yes. Well, I wanted to uh, wait with that line until the very end, but... Fine, you do it whenever you want, Frank. It's your story. But, you do it when you think it's... Well, right. no, I can do it uh, now as well. That's, that's no problem. Yeah. But in his letter, Ron, uh, John wrote, and I'm going to read it up literally as he wrote it down to me, every enemy soldier deployed to counter our attacks was one less man available for use against the defenders of Hill 314. Every shell and bullet fired at the man of Company E was one less available to fire at the man on Hill 314. And, and that, that says that's it all. completely that's true. Just, just a beautiful bit of uh, 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 writing there that explains that ev the Mortan battle is one of those ones that everybody's role in it was completely different because they're not, this is not a division fighting side by side in one location. There are battalions in different places with their own private wars going on, with their own things coming at them. We'll talk in our second show later on where Kevin will come in a lot and talk about the Lost Battalion on, the, on Hill 314 itself. But this action here is separate. And I, folks, had literally no idea this action that even took place until Frank told about it, whatever it was, a week ago. And that's why I bring in this story of the John O'Hare. And I've got a wartime photo of John O'Hare, thanks, uh, thanks to Frank. That's John O'Hare on the left there. Yeah, and that picture was taken in 1945 already in Magdeburg, Germany, as the two kids are two Germans who were working as translators. And if you take a very good look at, at John's helmet, you can see a little bit of the patch of the 30th oh, Infantry yeah, Division. Just see the patch there. Yeah, just very and, good, yeah. And I asked him about it. I said, I asked him, why did you paint on the patch on the helmet? Because that's a target for the Germans to shoot at. And John said, that's how you know that this picture was taken after the war ended. I right. only did that after the war because, of course, it's an objective to shoot at. And that's an amazing view towards Hill 314. Well, that's exactly where we our camera teams. You, Frank and Kevin, we may carry on chatting for a few minutes. We're going to let our camera teams have their break now. And we'll find out why Duncan's not. We're not getting Duncan's images at all for some reason. But that is the view there of Hill 314 for our second show in now two hours, 20 minutes. Can you zoom in on that, Mag, a bit? I don't want to put you, you've been uh, doing sterling work. Without you, Mag, we would have no show. So, Brad, Mag, you are absolutely brilliant. I owe you a huge favor. I will I will make the bed. I will do the washing for a few days, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> here's the view of 314 over there. And that'll be all part of our second show. And um, that, we're, we're still north of Mortan itself in the village of Lenerfberg. So that's the hill where the second part of the action comes from. So, guys, you've done fantastically well, given the heat. Um, wander back to the village, give yourselves a break, have some water, get your batteries charged up, and we'll try and find out what, um, what's going on with Duncan's imagery, and maybe we can bring Colin in later or something. I don't know, but we'll work it out. But thanks very much, Matt. You've been absolutely brilliant. Without you, we would, we would just be three old guys talking in, a, in our offices. So thank God we've got the images coming through. So 
Mag, I'll drop you at the meeting, let you walk back up to the, well, I'll leave you in for a minute while you walk back up and we'll, we'll, thanks Mag, you've been fantastic, brilliant. Thank um, you, Mag. Go and get in some shade. We love you, Mag, everybody loves you. So Frank, <laughs> um, that, that story was incredible. And um, yeah, we, we, we kind of run, not rushed through that first show, but with the heat, we did go through things quite quickly because, you know, the, the, there's a lot to cover in that story. The second show is a bit more relaxed because we've got less locations, frankly. But the Nerfberg battles, what, what other things can you share about it for men you've spoken to? Because I think you would agree with me, everybody's battle was very different there, depending on which bit of the road you were on. Well, that's what you can, uh, can add to the stories because this is only John's story, which I just told you. Yeah, There are hundreds of stories like this. And to add one more thing to John's story is that John only joined the 30th division after the battle for St. Lou, and he was a bazooka man. And while going through those gardens uh, after the first attack in Lenev Borg towards Hill 314, uh, John found a hole from the artillery and he said, I jumped into the hole and the artillery was still coming in at some point. And all of a sudden a hat rolls into the, the hole and I saw the rest of the body on top of it. And I looked at the face and it was the Sergeant who actually got me into the 30s division. He was killed there in Lunov Borg. And it's, it's always the same with the, with the big battles, of course, you've got people talking about the main event. And Mortain, of course, is mostly about Hill 314. Yeah. And that's when it's interesting that you're going up to St. Bartholomew and then the fallback power point. And yeah, the station, of course, in Lenev Borg is, is, is very famous, but this is the other side of Lenev Borg. The, the battle in Lenev Borg was not only at the railroad station. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do. Us three now, the camera teams have gone. We're just going to sum up what we've covered in that show, just for another five minutes or so, get across any points we didn't make earlier. I was a little bit um, stressed yep. about the cameras and the images there and what have you. So we can just go back and let's reconfirm and, about what we did. Frank wants to say something again. Yeah, I want to, I want to add another story, which is... Sure, please, go for it. It has nothing to do with, with a battle or so, but uh, there was also a guy in the, in the 117th, and his name was... Uh, Hendricks, Hendricks, and he always carried two canteens with him. There was always one canteen with bottle and one canteen, of course, with local liquor in it. Yeah. And, and what he did was while the battle for, um, yeah, close to Le Neuf Borg or St. Bartholomew was going on, he went through a little valley, which was full with, with Germans, and he returned to his own man and he just carried a a bag with axe with him. So we went. So when they asked him, where did you get those axe? He pointed out a building, which was on the German side. So we managed to get through the German front line, collected some axe with the help from the French owner, got back through the German lines, back to his own lines, and surprised some of his comrades with a couple of axe. Wonderful. That's the kind of story that we love. And, um, so Kevin, let's go back and recap the whole the whole of what we've done in this show just briefly. We'll we'll bring the image up, uh, the, that first map we had at the beginning, um, uh, which I seem to have lost for a second. Bear with me, I'll get to it. In a sure. Second. Uh, while um, you're doing that, well, first yeah, of all, did he get a yeah. medal for that, Frank? Sorry. Did he get a medal for getting the? Uh, the no idea. Guys? No <laughs> idea. <laughs> that should have been a silver star at least. Um, but uh, you know, I think what we're what we're kind of talking about here, roughly, and I'll say specifically, is when you go to these places, there's no place that you can stand and understand a battle. You it, it, you know, you're talking about a division. I mean, look at the size of this map. You know, yeah. there, there's no one place that decides the whole thing. These are individual actions over an area miles long, or you guys would say kilometers. That that you know that's making the difference, and so there's there's no place that you can just stand and understand it. Normandy Beach, same thing. You know, there, there's uh, there's actions over, you know, what like seven miles. Um, but uh, but to get into what you're asking me to do, Paul, uh, looking at this map, so we're seeing the action and reaction uh, on August seventh. That's going to go on for six days. So we've talked about the blocking off 
the northern route. So that we, yeah, um, we blocked off the, the we started in San Bartolome there, where although it was desperate, and although they had Panthers and Mark IVs coming at them from five directions, and Franklin may or may not, the Colonel have knocked out a tank with a 45. They then fall back to that crossroad, which is here, the, the hedgerow, which is here somewhere, and they make that block in the road there, and then they hold the area here. And then meanwhile, 119, which we haven't really talked about yet, because they're over to the west. In fact, we will barely bring them in. They're kind of coming in, and the elements of the, the 9th Division are coming down here to move in from the, uh, from the west there. And then here's the action uh, that Frank was talking about a, a bit earlier, E Company 117, this attack that comes down that ends itself getting stuck in the village of Nerfberg over here. That's kind of what we're talking about there. And then the Abbe Blanche is where is is near where the, the railway station were. The railway station, in fact, is this on this road here. And there's those blocking actions around there. I'll bring up the map again, the other map of the actual roadblocks, and then we can carry on talking about that for a bit. So um, there was the rail, the railway line was over here, and the, the road past the railway line was down here. And the action that Frank just talked about is over here. It's over on the other no, side. No, of the road not marked it, on the map. It's just not on the map. Uh, yeah, it's not marked. Just to the, the lower left of the map. That's where that happened. And that's because these divisional histories. I mean, the one I was the one the, the book I've been using a lot is Saving the Break the Breakout by Alwyn Featherstone. But it's very very limited in maps. And I think he mostly wrote it based on um, uh, veterans' testimonies. I don't know that he actually walked the battlefield at all. That certainly if he did, he wasn't there for very long. And you know, we, you could you could do two or three hour long shows talking about all the various little uh, um, engagements that took place around there. Can start um, from the German point of view. The Germans in losing San Barthelemy, in, in being mis held back by these roadblocks, their plan is now falling apart, isn't it? But they don't maybe know it yet, and the Americans who engage them don't know it. But the Germans are kind of falling apart, aren't they? Yes, very much so. Uh, we were talking about the. The airstrikes, the, the American resistance that's really holding them up. Uh, the time, like we said, is ticking away that, you know, they're, they're supposed to be making good progress on the way to Avranche here. And they are stymied in and around Mortain um, and getting pummeled. Uh, you know, the, I, I, the, the term that comes to mind for me is Pyrrhic victory. You know, they've made this progress, but at a cost of losing tank after tank after tank. Um, so within the first day, uh, this is pretty much a done deal, but their orders are to not retreat. Uh, they have surrounded an element of Mortain that we're going to talk about in the next section. But, uh, so to the Americans, you know, the Americans are fighting desperately uh, to hold the line, or the Germans are fighting desperately to, to maneuver and, and to keep going west, and that is just not happening. Uh, they are pretty much up against a steel wall and they are just hammering away to no effect. And so they're feeling pretty desperate. And remember, this is not, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, Fallschirmjäger unit or, you know, a um, uh, I, I, Fallschirmjäger is the wrong word. This is not a regular army unit. This is not one of those uh, rapidly raised units that the Germans do later in the war. This is the SS. These are the elite troops, best equipped. Uh, you know, best defended. They've got the, you know, some of the best tanks of the German army, and they can't break through this National Guard American unit. Um, so it's a very, it's a big tell on the status of the American army. So and to what add to that, of. though, Hitler may still think they are the same divisions they were when they arrived in Normandy a month earlier or six weeks earlier, but they've already lost a lot of their strength. The first SS, it's not a whole division that commits. It's, 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 it's part of a division. Hitler wanted to have seven full divisions attack for Avranche, didn't he? It ended up right. being five, but they're not complete, and they're and and they don't even start complete. They're starting with you know we can we can do other shows about how unreliable the Tiger tanks and Panthers are and how their mechanized you know their their mechanized army isn't it's it's it's, it's surface efficient, but behind it is all this lack of spares, lack of maintenance vehicles. So Hitler thinks that this unit is the same SS unit it was that arrived in Normandy a week ago, but it is no longer that because, you know, we're just, you are, you are quite proud, prou uh, proudly and correct, correctly bigging up the National Guard Division there. But let's be honest, the British and Canadians have already taken away a lot of the fighting strength of these divisions up near Caen. So when they pull out from Caen to do this, they're already at less strength. So let's, let's spread the, 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 
the um, credit out where it's due. The British and Canadians smash up these divisions near Caen, and then they run into the National Guard division here in Mortan and run into very, very um, uh, keenly defending. And Frank, you're, you're the student of the 30th. Where are these guys from in the 30th? They're, 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 they're a National Guard. They're mostly from, um, from, from particular areas, yes? Yes, they're mostly from the Carolinas, North, South Carolina, uh, Kentucky. There were quite some guys from Kentucky. Of course, when they needed replacements, troopers came from all over the United States. Um, but they're mostly from the Carolinas. And they started their training, for example, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, but also went to Camp Landing, Florida, Camp Atterbury in Indiana, before they shipped from Boston to Europe and arrived in early 1944 in England. Uh, they landed about a week after D-Day on Omaha Beach with most of the guys landing in the, uh, the dark green sector. Uh, there's a little bit of a discussion going on when they landed, but of course not the entire division landed on a specific day. It took several days for the entire division to get ashore, uh, assemble, and then, then went through Isigny sur mer uh, got their first real engagement with the Germans at saint jean de Die. I don't know if I pronounce it, pronounce it correctly, but... That's the short the, the day. On the day, yeah. yeah. The, the day. And that's when they moved down further south. Uh, they were uh, at saint Fromont with the, the Vera Canal crossing, went up to saint Lô where they were bombed two days in a row by their own planes uh, at, at, in late July, before they finally got to Mortain in, in early, Mort uh, early August, I'm sorry. Yeah. And... Yeah, and that's when well, my, my when figures here happened. between July the 7th and July the 13th, the 30th Division sustained 3,200 casualties. And then on July the 25th, in the Operation Cobra friendly fire bombing, a further 662 men lost the friendly fire. So they've had a really bad time before they arrive in this, in the, into this sector, which they're thinking, as we said at the beginning of the show, was going to be a quiet break for a couple of days. They have no idea that literally within hours of arriving, there's going to be German tanks coming at them out of the fog. And there's discussion going on YouTube about exactly how many tanks are part of this, this, this Operation Lutich. And I was reading figures anywhere between about 70 and 200 tanks. Um, one of the, uh, Sheldrake 6 is saying about 90 tanks. Um, I, I'm not going to disagree with that. There may be a few self propelled guns there as well. There's half tracks as well. The point is, it would be very hard to actually give an exact figure for how many German vehicles are pushing part of this attack. Some don't even get there at all. Some get snarled up in convoys and don't even get to the battlefield at all. But um, frankly, if you're one, you know, as we're going to be talking about in our second show, one battalion of one regiment up on the hill, Hill 314, when they see the numbers of armored vehicles coming at them along these roads, it would seem like you're, you're, being fa you're facing a, a massive, massive great army coming your way. And that's where I think we'll leave this show and bring it to an end shortly and leave it with a bit of um, drama for the second show and the, the hill there later on. So... Um, I think we've covered that quite well. It was a bit tense moments when the meeting stopped and we lost the camera feeds there, but that's all fun. Um, <laughs> and that was, the, that was the, sh the show that had the more logistical stops in it. There were several stops there and little things to work out there. The second show is a little bit easier in that we're, we're at just three locations rather than I think six for the first show. So um, I'll bring this one to an end in a second. And don't forget the second show will be starting in an hour and eight minutes from now. So Kevin and Frank will join us again. We'll hopefully have a few more camera images later on this afternoon. We'll find out what's going on with Duncan. If not, we've got Colin in reserve to bring him on as a sub to, uh, to, to try and get the camera action. But at least we've got Mag. We can always depend on Mag. Mag is my, uh, she's my first <laughs> name on the team sheet every, every match these days. Mag so, makes um, good. So good. So thank you very much, gentlemen. I've enjoyed that. Hopefully people watching that have enjoyed it. it Give us a little break to, to cool down and... Uh, and feed my cats. Uh, Sheldrake just six has just corrected his number to 190 tanks now. So from he missed, but you know, I mean, I've read anything from 7,200 tanks as part of that. But sometimes when books in, when they say tanks, they're including self-propelled guns as tanks, which we know they aren't quite tanks. So Marders, things like that, Stubbs, they're yeah. not tanks technically. So and half tracks with 75 and the guns on, they're not tanks. But some authors include them as tanks. So. Let's Tanks, armor, and 80 and 250 armored vehicles. Who's going to be short? Anyway, thanks, guys. I'm going to end this stream. Join us again in an hour's time. Um, we'll all have time to, to cool down and um, 
for, remember, for those watching, this is the first time. Sometimes the show is a little bit more uh, slick than this one. This one went a bit ragged. It's my part that was ragged, not the historians who've been excellent. Um, right. Click subscribe. Um, if you'd like to become a patron, I've had a couple of new patrons the last couple of days, which has been fantastic. I'll maybe give them a name check later on. But we'll see you all in an hour and five minutes' time. So thanks, everybody. See you later. Bye. See you guys. Right. See you soon. Right. So that was part.